next on Unsolved Mysteries. Just after World War II, a squadron of five Avenger torpedo bombers disappeared into the Bermuda Triangle. Some people are saying that this mystery has finally been solved. Two women out for a stroll, a discarded shoe, and then a gruesome discovery. There was a foot inside the shoe. A van full of holiday travelers. Death seems inevitable. Can two strangers save them? She was a lonely widow. He was a convicted murderer on death row. Then, let's go, let's go. she helped him escape. Join me for five cases that will surprise you and perhaps even shock you. I'm Dennis Farina, and for the next hour, it's Unsolved Mysteries. It became known as the legend of the Lost Patrol. Just after World War II, a squadron of five torpedo bombers took off from Florida. Just five hours later, the entire squadron vanished. Where? Over the Bermuda Triangle. Where else? Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The Navy squadron, Flight 19, was on a routine training flight. It vanished somewhere off the Florida coast in an area known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic, the Bermuda Triangle. For nine years, aviation investigator John Meyer has studied the flight plant and radio transmissions of the Lost Squadron. When I read the story and I read the transcripts of the radio conversations, uh, it triggered a response in me and I said, if this is true and this is true, then, then I think I can find one of the airplanes. Meyer has never believed that the squadron disappeared because of a mysterious force coming from the Bermuda Triangle. We must have got lost after that last turn. He believes the planes all crashed in the ocean due to a series of navigational errors. I got a ditch, you read. Meyer is convinced that one of the Avengers was forced to ditch in the water just 30 miles off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida. But finding a single Avenger in the ocean was an overwhelming task, until a national tragedy made it possible. When salvage crews searched for debris from the space shuttle Challenger, they located the wreckage of a plane. It was at a depth of 400 feet. We knew we had a wreck, but we didn't know what type of airplane it was. And to say I was on the edge of my seat, along with my colleagues, would be an understatement. An underwater survey revealed that the plane was an Avenger torpedo bomber. Could it be one of the planes of the Lost Patrol? More than 40 years of coral and barnacle growth made positive identification impossible. The only way to prove whether this is indeed Flight 19 aircraft is going to be to raise that sucker out of the water. I and my partners believe that we're correct, but it'll remain a mystery until we can raise the airplane. John Meyer and his partners began a massive recovery operation called Project 19. 30 miles off the Florida coast, a four-man submersible was launched to pinpoint the location of the plane. Previous dives had shown the engine and propeller had separated from the main body of the plane. There was a Navy Bureau number on the engine, there was an engine manufacturer's number on the engine, and there was also a manufacturer's stamp number in the engine block. So if we raise that engine, we should be able to get a positive ID from that. Now as to how, how much corrosion has occurred over the last 40, almost 46 years now, it's difficult to say. The submersible's robotic arm maneuvers nylon straps around their propeller and engine housing. A 50-ton crane begins to slowly raise the wreckage from beneath the sea. 
35 minutes later, the propeller and engine assembly is hoisted on board. The condition of the wreckage kills any possibility of immediate identification. Should be our last dive that we have to, to go down for to do, to do a hookup. The crew plans the next and most crucial phase, the recovery of the plane's wing and fuselage section. Mike and myself will be up front, Dave and John. This is our next to last scheduled dive. This one hopefully will complete the rigging and we will pull the plane up on the next lift. Three hours later, the rigging is complete. The crew of the submersible attaches the primary lift cable to the harness that cradles the sunken Avenger. The huge crane begins to lift the plane 400 feet to the surface. The plane weighs about three times more than expected. The harness and cable strain under the weight. Night closes in, making the recovery more dangerous. Then suddenly, the crane steel cable goes slack. The plane either collapsed or something parted. He wasn't even pulling up when it actually happened. And something went boom. And now there's not much load. Okay. What went back down? In what shape? We don't oh, know. Okay. What broke? We'll take a look as it comes out. The cable is snapped in two, sending the Avenger back to its watery grave. Very disappointing, but we're not dead. We're going back. We're going to get it. This complicates things. Uh, we'll have a game plan first thing in the morning. It's the uh, Bermuda Triangle continues its ways. Just after dawn, the submersible is launched to relocate the wreckage. It's still sitting in the same position that it was before which is upside down, all the rigging is still on it. So all we've got to do is get down there, hook onto it, and it's going to come up. We're going to see it today. Things are in position as good as they can be. We're about to start the lift, bring it up very slow, very easy. Let's see what we can do for reinforcing, video while we go, and hopefully get it on deck. An hour and a half later, the plane is less than 100 feet from the surface. But there's a problem. The wings are buckling. Divers are immediately dispatched. We put straps about three quarters of the way out along the wings, because when it was down at 40 or 50 feet, even in these light seas, the heave of the boat was causing the wings to flap up and down about two feet. We don't want to stress it. So we put straps around the outer portions of those wings, brought them up tight to give them a little extra support. Two and a half hours later, the plane breaks the surface. For John Meyer, the recovery of the Avenger marks the end of a nine-year search. You know, it's, it's strange. You'd think you'd be elated and everybody screaming and jumping up and down. I, it's there, but it's subdued, you know? It's tempered by knowing some good people died a long time ago, and uh, we're not going to forget them. The wreckage is taken to Marineland near St. Augustine, Florida. There, numbers are collected from various parts of the aircraft. Several of these numbers do partially match those of the lost Flight 19. But unfortunately, John and his team are still unable to prove the recovered plane belonged to the missing squadron. Once again, the Bermuda Triangle has guarded its secrets, and the fate of the lost patrol remains an unsolved mystery. Next, a family's harrowing accident and the two mysterious strangers who rescue them from certain death. Sixty miles northeast of Monterey, Mexico, the Dover family was making their way to a Christmas celebration with relatives. It's a traveler's worst nightmare. You're a stranger in a foreign country. You don't know the language. You're gravely injured alone on an isolated road. And if you don't get help quick, 
you face certain death. The trip began two days before Christmas. Six members of the Dover family and one friend packed the car and headed off on the long drive to Mexico. Hey, turn around, sit down, please. We had just purchased a new customized van, and it was loaded with everything. We had a television, and we had a refrigerator. So we were stocked up and just making extremely good time and having a good time. The drive from Atlanta to Ciudad Victoria was about 1,200 miles. The Dovers planned to complete the trip in just 48 hours and arrive by Christmas Day. To save time, they stopped only for gas and the adults took turns driving. We got into Laredo, Texas, Saturday morning, which was Christmas Eve, and crossed the border. The further along we got, it, uh, in the afternoon, it really began to get cold and, and began to snow. The weather was getting really bad, and I had been to Mexico several times in the past, and I had never experienced anything like this in my life. It was extremely cold, rainy, snowy. It was just very uncharacteristic for the area. Vance was behind the wheel when they crossed the border. They were just an hour away from Monterey, the last major city, before their final destination. We were supposed to go over a mountain range to get to the city, and then we were diverted. There was a policeman in the road. We need to go to Monterey. Vance learned the main road through the mountains had been closed. And we had to circle around the mountains and come into Monterey from a more easterly direction. And the snow began to really pick up, and it was a real driving snow. It wasn't coming just straight down, and, and the, the sides of the road began to be coated. You could see it on the hills. Vance, why don't you slow down a little bit there, buddy? It's uh, getting a little bit slick out there. OK. And my father had just told me to, to even be extremely careful. Moments after he had told me that, I suddenly lost control. How much time elapsed? I don't know how long I was out. I have no idea if it was five minutes or an hour. But uh, uh, I woke up, and it was just a matter of moments when someone opened the door and pulled me out. And the pain that I felt at that time was absolutely excruciating. Vance was completely unaware of the tragedy that surrounded him. The four occupants of the other vehicle had been killed instantly. Several people in his own car were barely alive. A passing American couple who just happened to be driving by joined the rescue effort. My father, he was taken and, and put in the back of a pickup truck, as well as my grandfather. My grandfather had received just severe head injuries to the point of his skull was showing, his, cut, his head was just cut really badly. And uh, the, the doctors later told us that by him putting, being put in the back of a pickup truck actually saved his life because the cold weather actually helped seal up and clot the blood. Through a haze of terrible pain, Vance realized that the two Americans had taken charge of the rescue operation. My cousin Tommy was uh, pulled from the van and his uh, vital signs were taken and it was assumed that he was dead. Still not getting a pulse. Pulling other people out and uh, trying to revive the ones that they thought were still alive. The nearest clinic was in Monterey, approximately an hour's drive. The unidentified American woman stayed by Vance's side during the entire trip. The hospital I was taken into was, was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It reminded me almost like a mass unit or a, something out of a war movie. We're trying to help you. Can you tell me why? She told me that my leg was broken really bad. And she told me that they didn't have any anesthesia, that they had to put it in traction. She said they were going to have to put a pin through my knee. Where, where's everybody else? Where are the others? There's a man and a woman and a child here. The nurse was referring to Vance's cousin Tommy, his friend Marianne, and Tommy's son, David. The nurse told me that they were injured severely, they had head injuries, and she didn't think that they would make it through the night. There appeared to be no sign of my father and grandfather, and I had all kind of thoughts go through my head. I mean, I mean, they weren't at the hospital. I didn't know, maybe they were taken to a morgue. I mean, I had, I had no idea. 
and no one in the hospital knew where they were at. Christmas morning dawned with a Christmas miracle. Vance woke up to find that his cousin had escaped unharmed and that Marion and Tommy were going to pull through. He was surprised to see that the mysterious woman, his guardian angel, was still with him. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It brought a lot of joy to me, knowing that she was there. And she, uh, she brought us both a little Christmas present, and she spent Christmas morning with us there. The woman raised Vance's spirits even higher when she told him that his father and grandfather were still alive. They're going to be fine. They're, they're at another clinic, and my husband is with them right now. You remember anything about last night? Uh, I was driving. And... She told me that her and her husband were on vacation, and they happened upon the accident just moments after it occurred. You got a pulse? I'm getting a pulse here. Okay. I've always wondered what would have happened had they not come upon the accident. Because we were an hour or so outside of this major city, and there was nothing out there at all. And these people just showed up. Doctors showed up out of nowhere. I feel like it was a miracle. Uh, many times it's an accident, and you know, we just drive by an accident. But, uh, and they could have done that that day, but they didn't, they stopped. And through their stopping, they saved the lives of our family. And we just want to say thank you. Update. One of our viewers in Houston, Texas, realized that she had heard the very same story from her friends, Dr. Nancy Neth Hannon and her husband, John. The Hannons were, in fact, the good Samaritans who had rescued the Dover family. Nice to meet you, Nancy. A few weeks later, the Dover family gathered to meet the Hannons and compare memories of that frightening Christmas Eve. I, I guess, as a physician, that was one of the most helpless feelings I've ever had. I mean, to have the knowledge and everything, but not the tools to do anything. It, it was just really frustrating. To us, you were like an angel from God, both of you, that you were right there at the time, and, and had you not been there at all, the whole family, uh, you know, could have possibly died, and you were so instrumental, and so we just wanted to say thank you. For the Dover family, the gathering was a chance to say thank you, and to finally close this dramatic chapter of their lives. Next, sometimes falling in love can take an unexpected twist, especially if you fall in love with a convicted killer. Muskogee, Oklahoma. All right, make a wish and blow those candles out. Sherry Nickerson's 15th birthday party was hardly a happy event. She was living with her uncle's family, and though they did their best, it was impossible to pretend that anyone was happy. I was numb. I didn't, I didn't feel anything. I wasn't happy. It, it was the worst birthday of my life. No surprise, Sherry's party included a number of uninvited guests. Oklahoma State Troopers were posted everywhere. The troopers were there because two lifers had escaped from a nearby Oklahoma prison just nine days earlier. And Sherry's mother, Donna Moses Brown, drove the getaway car. I'm Michael. I know. I'm Donna. At first, Donna thought that she was simply doing a good deed when she was introduced to Michael Wayne Brown. Her church group had started writing letters to convicts to help them find spiritual comfort. You know, I don't know if I can make it in this place if it wasn't for those letters that I get from you. Oh, well, you know, whatever we can do to help. She was lonely. She hadn't had anybody for a very long time. And she needed that companionship, someone to talk to her about things and show her love and affection. And that's what she got from him. How you doing? I'm OK. He spoke it's with hard. her. And I think that that's pretty much you know, all that mattered. He wrote her. It was somebody new in her life. And uh, 
I think that it probably could have been anybody to him, but she was the victim that fell into the, in the line of fire, I guess. Look what I brought you. Oh, Mike wow. Wayne Brown, like a lot of the men that are incarcerated for long periods of time, they really don't have any concern for other people's rights or, or lives. And they've got all the time in the world to scam, to scheme on people, and they get quite good at it. They can sell you a chainsaw in the desert. She wrote him every day. She talked to him on the phone every day. It kind of started and went full force. There was no slowing down. I think Donna Brown was under the misconception that Mike Wayne Brown was just a misunderstood young man who, through unfortunate circumstances, was doing time. It seemed that everyone but Donna knew Michael Brown was a cold-blooded killer. Nine years earlier, when Brown was 18, he and another teenager, Dennis Woodward, burglarized an insurance office in Oklahoma. What are you doing here? Huh? What are you Sorry. doing here? Shut up! Richard Sullivan picked the wrong time to stop by the office. Turn around. Turn around and face the wall. Give me the gun. Turn around. Brown was very, very hyper after that event. He said, I, I killed him, I killed him, almost bragging about it. He looks over at Woodward and he said, if I had one more bullet, I would have shot his eyes out. And uh, thereafter, uh, they went off to have breakfast at a local restaurant. While Brown was dining on his bacon and eggs, 41-year-old Richard Sullivan bled to death on his office floor. He left behind a wife and a young daughter. Michael Wayne Brown was put on death row. However, the sentence was later commuted to life without parole. By the time Brown met Donna Moses, he had already spent nine years in prison. Donna had been married twice. Tragically, both of her husbands had been murdered. It was ironic that Donna now found herself in love with a killer. It was consuming her too much. She didn't have time for anything else but him. I mean, she could visit him every weekend, and it was like the whole week was preparing to see him. This is your copy. Yeah. Here she is. Hi. Hi. And then, just three months after they met, do you, Donna Moses, take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, to love and to cherish him from this day forward, as long as you both shall live? I do. Love you. Love you. Moments after the ceremony, the honeymoon was over. Brown was put back in shackles and his prison orange and returned to his cell. Donna sent her children to stay with relatives and then followed Brown as he was transferred from prison to prison, sometimes living in her car. Michael Wayne Brown became Donna's whole world. He was eventually transferred to a minimum security prison. It was a perfect opportunity for escape. Three weeks later, Brown and another inmate jumped a four-foot fence and raced for freedom. Donna was waiting nearby in the getaway car. Let's go, let's go! By the time guards discovered the inmates were missing, they were long gone. A few days after the escape, police tracked Brown to Paris, Texas, but missed him by a matter of minutes. For three years, Donna's family had no word from their mother and no idea if she was alive or dead. Finally, Sherry received an unexpected phone call. Hello? Hi, Sherry? Yeah? Hi, it's me, Mom. Mom? Are you OK? Yeah, I I'm OK. I'm out of Oklahoma, but I want to come home. My it was just kind of a quick thing, and that's all. She told me she loved me, and that was it. Donna said she wanted to come home, but she never did. I'm afraid that she's afraid that we don't want her back. I'm afraid that my mom feels like that she did something really bad and that she can't face us anymore. How are we gonna act to her? And what I say to her is, it's okay. Authorities never filed charges against Donna Brown. They believed that she was a victim and was coerced. 
There is no arrest warrant either issued by the state of Oklahoma or by the federal government for her. She's not wanted on any charges, and in fact, uh, we would encourage her, if she's no longer with Brown, or if in fact she is with Brown, to immediately contact the authorities. Update. Michael Wayne Brown has been captured. One of our viewers logged onto our website and noticed a striking similarity between Michael and Donna Brown and a couple who owned a local video store. They had been living under the assumed names of Kenneth and Linda Ginter. Once they were identified, the couple drove themselves back to Oklahoma and turned themselves in. Donna was reunited with her family. Michael Brown was returned to prison and received an additional two years for his escape. They are still married. Next, hands that heal, a controversial technique that defies conventional medicine. You are witnessing a controversial healing technique called therapeutic touch, or TT. Its practitioners believe that by running their hands a few inches above the body, they can pinpoint areas of disease or injury. They also claim they can direct energy from their own bodies to others in order to promote healing. Does therapeutic touch really work? To find out, we went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and talked to a TT practitioner. One day, Janet Ziegler drove her three boys to their regular martial arts class. At just seven years of age, Janet's youngest son, Michael, was already an accomplished pianist. Michael went in, and as he was slipping his shoes off, he put his hand up in the jam of the door. By that time, I'd gotten out of the car, and Michael ran out of the school, and he was, I don't think he realized what happened. He wasn't crying or anything, but his finger was bleeding profusely, and he said, Mom, I think I pinched my finger. And I looked down at his finger, and it was gone, and I said, Michael, where is your finger? Michael, what's wrong? I got my finger caught in the door. Okay, stand very still. Almost instinctively, Janet began to treat Michael with therapeutic touch. This immediately calmed him. He didn't shed a single tear at all through the whole process. OK, sweetie, let's go wash it off. I looked in the door jam to find the finger, and I found it. It was actually unrecognizable. It was totally squashed, and of course, it, the nail was gone. It really didn't look like a finger, but it was the only thing in the door jam, so I assumed that's what it was. It was scary. Uh, I hadn't started to cry or anything, but uh, the blood and the and seeing my finger gone and wondering what's gonna happen. It was just a fear that went through me. A friend rushed Janet and Michael to a local emergency clinic. The injury was not life-threatening, but Michael's future as a pianist was now in question. I'm sorry, but this is never gonna take. I don't think we can reattach this well, finger. please try. He's a pianist, he's got to have this finger. Need a suture kit, some saline? The doctor, he turned to me and he said, what are you doing to him? And I said, I'm doing therapeutic touch to keep him calm. The energy of the finger. So he said, well, I don't know anything about that. He said, but whatever it is you're doing, keep doing it, because I've never seen a child so calm in such a situation. Despite his misgivings, the doctor reattached the fingertip. He recommended that Michael see a plastic surgeon as soon as possible. The very next day when I went to the plastic surgeon, he unwrapped it, looked at it, and said, I'm sorry, this is not going to take. He's going to lose his finger. And he just wrapped it up again, a dry dressing, didn't do anything at all to the finger. And it went like that every week. Hello, doctor. Mrs. Ziegler? Oh, Michael, let me see your hand. For eight weeks, Janet used therapeutic touch on Michael's finger. And for eight weeks, the plastic surgeon warned that the reattachment would probably never work. Look, the scab's gone. Looks great. They removed the bandage, the scab, and everything, and I saw, like, almost a brand new finger with new skin and everything. I was totally overwhelmed. As soon as the last bandage came off, Michael was back at the keyboard. Less than a month later, he placed first 
in a piano competition. The experience of my accident and what my mom did for my finger most definitely changed my feelings about therapeutic touch. Before it happened, I would go to my mom, get the treatment from her, but was a little skeptical. You know, it looked sort of funny and would joke about it. After this experience, I was totally 100% believing in her therapeutic touch and that it definitely worked. But not everyone is convinced that therapeutic touch really works. I think the practitioners are good and honest and kind nurses. I think their therapy is baloney. A nurse named Dolores Krieger first developed therapeutic touch and defined what makes an effective healer. What you were moved by originally is a compassion, you see, a compassion to help another person. And it's the power of compassion that brings you across that bridge. The good effects are primarily placebo effects. That means that what the patient believes will happen will happen. Are Cindy and Kate still here? A couple we'll call George and Marie learned about therapeutic touch firsthand when Marie was pregnant with her first child. We can't wait any longer, George. We have to do a cesarean. George and Marie's daughter, Mariah, was born nearly three months premature and weighed less than two pounds. She soon developed critical problems in her lungs. The nurse disconnected the wiring or the tubing from the baby and put the baby in my wife's arms. And my wife held the baby and she started to cry. And um, I thought that was it. I, I thought the baby was dead. In a last ditch effort to save her life, doctors put the tiny infant on a respirator. Then one of the intensive care nurses began treating Mariah with therapeutic touch. I yes. spoke to your wife, Marie. It's therapeutic. I continued to take care of Mariah for the rest of my shift and, you know, continued to work on her direct energy in a therapeutic touch manner to her. Basically, I'm a very logical, bottom line, shoot straight from the hip person. And for someone to talk to me about alternative medicines, they would have to prove it to me. oxygen numbers. The levels are going up. That's good, right? She's responding well. Look at her. I'm an accountant. Uh, I deal in numbers. And to see this, I can relate to it. Every time Joanne took care of the baby, every time Joanne had the baby, the baby got better. Marie was in critical condition also. Joanne began to use therapeutic touch with her as well. Joanne did basically the same thing for me as she had done for Mariah. And little by little, it worked. And the pain went away. And Joanne would not take credit for it. It was funny, she would just chuck it off like it, you know, it was just an everyday thing for her. It was part of her nursing technique. Your little girl wants her foodie. The bottom line is, my baby's alive. And I have the doctors to thank. I have the whole nursing staff to thank, and more so I have Joanne to thank, because I believe without Joanne, we wouldn't have this baby. Even the strongest believers in therapeutic touch admit that it does not always work. It is still considered by some to be an unproven therapy, but perhaps in the future, medical science will unravel the mystery of this intriguing technique. Next, a college freshman leaves class. Six months later, pieces of his body wash up on the local beach. Bristol, Rhode Island. Hey, man. When 18-year-old Brian Neisenfeld left home to attend college, he had high hopes for his future. He had written in his high school yearbook that his dream was to make a difference in the world. 
At the beginning of his second semester, Brian left his afternoon English class as usual. No one ever saw him again. Six months later, Lori Vales and her daughter Chelsea took a walk on Hog Island Beach just a few miles from the university. I noticed a shoe on the sand that was at the high tide line. Looks like somebody just walked out of their shoe. Oh my goodness. And I just kind of poked the shoe with my stick and it seemed hard, like something had been stuck inside the shoe. I realized there was like a white, very shiny white, almost plastic looking smooth surface and around it um, like a fleshy substance. So I knew right at that point that there was a foot inside the shoe. DNA tests determined the foot and a shin bone found close by were Brian's. Though authorities found no additional remains, they concluded that Brian was dead. When it was announced that the bones were possibly Brian's, it gave us some kind of uh, relief knowing that uh, he didn't just wander off. So what could possibly have happened to Brian Neisenfeld? And why would only a foot and a shin bone wash up on a beach? And where was the rest of his body? Well, some say his death was an accident. Others, that it was suicide. However, his family says that Brian was murdered. Largely based on the fact that we have not uncovered any evidence uh, whatsoever of foul play, we're inclined to believe this, this perhaps may have been a suicide. I don't think Brian would commit suicide. I don't think he did commit suicide. There's no evidence of that. There's never been any evidence of that. It's all theory. And an accident? I guess it's possible, but in my heart, my gut, I don't think that was the case. I believe Brian was murdered. Investigators try to reconstruct Brian's brief term at college. From the beginning, his life there was a struggle. Brian's academic career in high school came very easily for him. This was much more of a challenge. He missed his family that he was so close to, and I don't think he realized how much his family meant to him until he actually went away. I think Brian was homesick. He didn't do very well that fall semester, Brian. He, uh, his grades kind of plummeted. Investigators believe Brian's difficulties at school might have driven him to commit suicide. Brian? But it's possible something even more sinister Dad? may have led to his disappearance. Dad, you have to come up here and get me. Just by the inflection of his voice, I knew that he was in a crisis mood. I knew that he was scared. And he said, this kid is threatening me. He's harassing me on the phone. Was threatening to get on campus, threatening to beat him up. And I thought, if this kid can get on the campus, then security has to know about it. Brian. Campus security called a student advisor in Brian's dormitory, who then checked up on him. How you doing? Good. Brian said the threatening calls were from a former student, but he was either unwilling or unable to say what motivated the caller. Yeah, yeah. You're okay. Yeah, totally. I'm fine. See you all For reasons only he knew, Brian grew Brian, even I'm more trouble. Please, let me talk to you. Brian didn't tell anyone where he was going. He simply left class and did not return. Brian! Six days passed before anyone became suspicious. The minute he was called by the university, Brian's father set out for Rhode Island. Well, when I heard that, that my son, you know, that Brian was missing for a week, two things happened in my mind. One, I go through a state of disbelief and shock. And the other thing is, I gotta find him, I gotta get involved, I have to see what the hell happened. Nothing's changed. It's exactly the way we found it. <sighs> the gloves are still here. It's, it's, it's the middle of the winter. It looked like he stepped out to get a soda or go to dinner or something. It looked like I should wait and he's gonna show up again. But it was seven days, it was a week since he disappeared, so I knew he wasn't coming back to the room. 
Bryant's parents believe the former student who threatened Bryant over the phone had something to do with his disappearance. Investigators found out the name of the former student and learned that he and Brian had been close friends during his first semester. When questioned, he admitted to making the threatening phone calls, but said they were only a joke. Brian being unsure of himself, having some freshman jitters, really seemed to gravitate toward this one student. I do know just from talking to Brian's parents and reading some of Brian's poetry that he did seem to be a young man who was questioning his sexuality. And while I am not sure whether it was an overt homosexual relationship, I do think that there were undertones of that. Whatever the nature of their friendship, it ended suddenly. Get out! Brian never said why. Certainly one of the theories that I've explored is that this former student was going to expose his relationship with Brian, that there were certain things that Brian didn't want his parents to know, didn't want his hometown to know, and that his homosexuality could have been one of them. Was it possible that Brian was gay? Well, I guess it's possible. He would not say uh, what soured their relationship. He would not tell me anything in relationship to the relationship with the former student. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I... The former student, in my opinion, had something to do with Brian's death. He may not have been actual person to have done him in, but I think he had something to do with Brian's death. We were able to uh, meet uh, with that individual, uh, conduct a uh, comprehensive interview of him, and we are fully satisfied that that person had absolutely no responsibility in the disappearance of Brian Neisenfeld. I know somebody knows something. They're just afraid to talk, and I don't know why, but they are afraid to talk, they're afraid to come forward. Somebody has to know something about Brian. If you have any information about the case of Brian Neisenfeld, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.